This time on Poll Hub, it's time to do some dissecting, specifically of the 2024 election. While votes are still being counted in a few places and some races may not be settled for a few weeks, the headline stories are very clear. But do all the what happened explanations add up? The polls help us answer that question. And since October Halloween fun facts were such a big hit, we're bringing themed fun facts back for November. And I bet you can't guess what our theme is. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper. I'm Barbara Carvalho. I'm Mary Griffith. And I am Lee Marigoff. So the election is now behind us, and we wanted to talk about some of what has developed. I think one helpful way to look at this is expectations versus results, uh, because there were a lot of expectations, and the results didn't necessarily match them expectations, especially at the top of the ticket, would be a very close race. And it was a close race, but not in the Electoral College. That abortion and democracy versus economy and immigration would be the, the kind of the dueling facts that the voters decided on. I've got some real doubts about that. That there'd be a gender gap, an education gap, a geography gap. And there were, maybe not in the ways that some people had expected. And then there's the results. This is going to end up being about a two plus national vote win for Donald Trump but a much bigger, as we mentioned, Electoral College uh, margin. He won every single swing state and in almost every part of the U.S., including New York City, there were big gains in the voter shifting right. And then there's the Democrats, a little bit of good news for them. They won Senate seats in at least four swing states. There's a couple still being counted, even as Donald Trump won those states. So there was some of this ticket splitting that has been almost non-existent for a few years and is now back. So Expectations versus results. Lee, there's a lot to talk about here. I'll let you figure out where you want to start. Okay. First of all, I would take a, a risk of correcting you and saying, I think it won't be two plus. I think it will be two minus. So I think it's going to be one point something in the popular vote. It means absolutely nothing in the flow of history. But I think that there were certain things that happened. Some were more and some were less than we expect. So the less than we expected was the gender gap. Traditionally, it's been averaging about 19%. The difference between men going one way and women going another way. And this time it looks like it may be 20 or 21%, a smidgen higher, but nothing to write home about. And certainly less than the Harris team was hoping and banking for. I think there was some expectation along those lines that her suburban vote totals would be better. And fears on her part, which did turn out to be real, that her urban vote was not going to be as good. They were sort of hoping to plug up the vote among African-American and Latino voters and do better than some of the numbers were suggesting, and they were unable to pull that off. I do find that in my elections classes at Marist, one of the things we've been talking about is looking at different red and blue maps over time and pointing out that every election is idiosyncratic, but there are underlying trends. And as you pointed out, with the Electoral College, if you look at the map of who carried what state, it looks a lot like 2016 when the earlier Trump-Clinton race. I think the one difference in that is Nevada, where uh, Trump carries it this time. And if I'm not mistaken, he didn't in 2016. Having said that, the other thing I think that we're learning is that although we thought there was a lot of ticket splitting going on, between presidential candidates and senatorial candidates, meaning that Trump was getting some votes from people who then voted for Democrats for senator. I think when the dust settles, we're going to see that more of what we call bullet voting, which is people, some people showing up for Donald Trump, pulling his lever, and then leaving. Uh, so what you have is that created the gap between Republicans who were less successful in the Senate than they'd hope to be, while Democrats held on to some of the Senate seats that they had hoped to have. So I think that those are some kind of takeaways from this. And there's one that we always hear at the end of these things, whether there's a mandate or not. And I know it's always the case, but I'll say it for this election as well. If you take the people who aren't registered to vote and the people who didn't vote or the people who voted for their opponent, the winning mandate comes in around 22%. So that means 22% of the adult population actually voted for Donald Trump. That's always the case. But I think it's always good to point out that this huge groundswell of support isn't necessarily the whole country stepping in, in line. Anyway, so that's a couple of my takeaways. from. I do think that the Republicans have an opportunity, and I think one that they are ready for now, 
which perhaps they were not ready for in 2017. I don't think you can underestimate the fact that in addition to the presidency, they also have both houses of Congress and, of course, the Supreme Court, which Trump put in place with his last term. So I think we are in for some very significant changes and for the Republicans to take this opportunity to prove and to do what they have been talking about for quite some time. In terms of the electorate, I do agree with Lee to a certain degree in the sense that this electorate not only was idiosyncratic from the last couple that we've seen, but it, it was different in terms of a number of trends. And I know we've, we've chatted about the makeup of this electorate. One of the biggest trends that was reversed was the proportion of white voters that made up the electorate. So I would, I would qualify the comments that people are making in terms of this rightward trend of the country I think it's a I think it's it was an electorate and certainly many people in this country are looking for change but this was a this was a very different election in the sense that for the first time in oh is it over 30 years there was an increase in the proportion of white voters over people of color so 71% of the electorate was white and we have not seen that for quite some time there was a much lower turnout in urban areas. And we've certainly seen the differences in terms of attitudes, opinions, and issue direction between more urban areas and more rural areas. And so for whatever reason, nearly between eight and nine million people who voted for Joe Biden in 2020 decided that they were not going to go to the polls this time in support of either candidate. So I, I think that does put a lot of this in context, but it certainly does not mi minimize the opportunity that the Republicans uh, have going forward. Jay, I'm interested in your take on, on the issues. And one thing that I just wanted to point out is I think the Democrats have made, made a huge mistake in terms of focusing more so on the social issues as opposed to the more kitchen table issues. The economy really was a huge motivator for many voters out there, specifically inflation. I also think that the Republicans we're very strategic in linking economic issues to the um, issue of illegal immigration. Specifically, some of the analysis post-election has been discussing illegal immigrants coming in and taking jobs away from immigrants, perhaps who have come to this country legally. And I think that that was a driving force as well. But Jay, I know that you said that you had a different take perhaps on some of the issues that were driving the election. So I'm really interested to hear what your take is. Okay, so here I'm gonna spoil the party. I don't believe that issues have anything to do with presidential <laughs> elections any longer. And here's my thesis. College educated voters, but especially people who are interested in politics, which we know from all sorts of sources are a small minority of Americans. There's way more NFL fans than there are politics fans. We have, and I, I'm one of them. We, and I think all of us are, and I think in the polling industry, we all are. And I think in the political punditry industry, everybody is. We all come from a specific paradigm in the way we view how voters decide presidential races. And at least part of that is we believe that issues matter. We ask the question, which issue is most important to you or which issues are most important to you in your decision for president? That assumes that issues matter. And so when we ask somebody that question or when pundits are looking to try and understand what issues matter, we're assuming that issues are something that voters are actually thinking about when they make that choice. And I think there's two pieces of data that suggest that issues don't matter. One is the huge discrepancy between the vote on issues when voters are actually say, presented with the option to vote on an issue. So in Missouri, there was an issue uh, uh, on the ballot about abortion. Do you want to protect abortion rights? In Missouri, Donald Trump won Missouri by 20 points. That ballot initi initiative won in Missouri. There was a ballot initiative in Missouri about raising the minimum wage. That passed. Donald Trump won by 20 points. In Kentucky, Trump won by 30 points, but there was an initiative on the ballot that said, do you support using vouchers for public schools? This is a Republican issue. That's an issue that Americans or Kentuckians voted down, yet they voted for Donald Trump by 30 points. There's also the issue or the, uh, the other way of looking at th this, which is that if you look around the world at every country except for Mexico in the last two years, Every incumbent 
has been tossed out or every incumbent party, a little different in parliamentary systems, has been tossed out. Conservative or liberal, they've been tossed aside because of voter anger. I think there is an awful lot of evidence to suggest that issues for a majority of, of voters don't really matter or are a very small part of the equation. And a much bigger part of the equation is what used to be called, who would you rather have a beer with, which I think is misleading. I think it's more like, who would you rather have as your leading man of a sitcom for the next four years? And I say leading man on purpose, but sitcom for the next four years. And if you start with Ronald Reagan and come forward, every winner fits that bill. I'm not gonna do it, but go through. And every winner fits the bill of, that's the person, the guy, I'd rather see in my sitcom for the next four years. It would be more entertaining, it's more enjoyable, not an annoying voice, whatever the reason is. So there you go. That's, Jay, that's Jay, my takeaway from this election. Right away with one quick question. You won an Emmy on a series which was called? What Matters? And I'll tell you really, what I've been thinking about the last two weeks is the reason I went into journalism was because I thought that if you could present facts to people, they would make better decisions. I do not believe that any longer. And I think the series that we did, What Matters, was in 2000, I think it still did matter, but I think the media landscape has shifted so dramatically that for a majority of motors, what matters is not what we present in that series. It's who would you rather have as your leading man in your sitcom for the next four years? That, okay, I buy that, but ask Jay along the way with your other, whatever question you were gonna ask, why are people so angry? And is it that issues? I think we conflate a lot of different attitudes when we talk about character and issues and what people are thinking when they're voting for a candidate. I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater quite yet when it, when it comes to issues because I think issues were very much top of mind. And when you speak globally, Jay, I think the common thread um, across the world in tossing out incumbents is the issue of inflation. We certainly had significant inflation over the past year and a half, two years. Believe it or not, actually not as, as high or as badly as many places around the world. So incumbents do not do well in periods of inflation. And certainly that is a major issue that I think are on people's minds. We talked many times before the election about how did the Democrats get past the fact that people are walking into grocery stores at least once a week or at least every other week and paying an enormous amount for the staples that they need to have. You can literally, in New York, you can count your items. They average about $10 a piece, regardless of what it is you're purchasing. So I think that that is an extraordinary context for an incumbent party to overcome. So in that sense, I would still say that issues are a very important driving force. The second piece is that we also look to presidential elections to, again, talk about what you talked about and have a beer with, the character of the person that you're voting for. Well, I, I don't think that the winner in this case was somebody that people admired for his character. In fact, the majority of people who voted on election day had an unfavorable view of him. And one of, the, one of the things and the reasons why many pollsters thought this was going to be a very close race was because Kamala Harris actually had a better favorable rating than Donald Trump and a lower unfavorable rating than Donald Trump. And usually that is an indication of how people are going to vote. So in, I think in, in both instances, I wouldn't throw out issues. I think they were very front and center to Americans, particularly with regard to the economy and immigration. There are incredibly strong feelings about people who have come here illegally. And I don't think that character necessarily. Certainly, Trump is someone that can be considered a charismatic candidate and a charismatic president. But I don't think that it's about his character. I think I it's about what he's promising. I agree, but I didn't say character. I said, who do you want as your leading man in your sitcom? My key distinction is I don't think character matters anymore. I think it's very clear character doesn't matter to a majority of voters anymore either. Jay, in terms of the leading man in your sitcom for the next four years, how much was this a vote against Kamala Harris as opposed to a vote for Donald Trump and whether or not this country is actually ready for a female president? 
you know, we look at 2016, we look at 2024. What do we have in common? We have two very strong, capable women. Again, that's debatable. Again, Kamala Harris as vice president took a lot of flack specifically about her approach to immigration, you know, having to take on that issue during the Biden administration. But when we look at the similarities here, we're looking at voters who many of whom, Jay, as you pointed out, voted for ballot initiatives that Kamala Harris was perceived stronger on specifically about abortion. But yet those voters were not willing to pull the lever or fill in the box for Kamala Harris. And a majority on immigration still support citizenship for dreamers. Absolutely. So even on immigration, if you could put immigration on the ballot and initiatives, I don't think voters would vote the way that we perceive that they voted because of an issue for for Donald Trump. I just I well, but see, I I, I I still would I still would argue that this was more about change than it was about the candidates. I think that particularly Vice President Harris had a really difficult time, and I'm really not quite sure why. Obviously, a vice president has to walk a fine line between being supportive of the administration they were a part of and talking about the the differences. But you don't have to talk about the differences in terms of what has passed. What's important is to talk about the differences moving forward. And the fact that that campaign did not come close to answering that question for voters, I think was... was, But did they? Is that true? We know that the majority, a large majority of people got almost no information about the election over the course of the election. We, we know from the data, from the empirical data, not our, our polling data or anybody's polling data, from empirical data, how many people actually were watching or listening or seeing this news coverage. We know, for instance, that a very tiny minority, because there's, there was polling on this, a very tiny minority knew that his uh, that, that Donald Trump's former chief of staff said he was a fascist. We know that that relatively few even appreciated that his former vice president wouldn't vote for him. So I don't know that we know that voters knew any of this because I don't think voters, the majority of them, but, care. But I, I think that I think voters do know a couple of things. One, that despite the fact that there were economic indicators that the economy is great, people don't feel that. And that's very clear in our numbers as well. The places in this country that are struggling the most also are correlated with the most, with the strongest proportion of votes for the Republicans. And that goes from the top of the ticket down. We do know that people want to move past the Biden administration. They feel that things are not working in a variety of different ways. And I think for a campaign to not answer that question, whether people are paying attention or not, something comes through. The Harris campaign would say they did answer all of those questions. In fact, that there were very few policies that came from Donald Trump's campaign, and there were a lot of policy positions that came from the Harris campaign, but it didn't make a difference. Well, the Harris Harris campaign did not actually have a national campaign. They had a seven state strategy campaign. And so when we we look across the country and we look at places where vote totals were dramatically down for Democrats, I think that really speaks to the fact that this was not a national campaign with a national theme that resonated throughout the country. I think when you have a candidate that is also struggling to define themselves and to define what their future vision is for the country going forward, as the Harris campaign, I believe, was, you're making it hard for voters to follow. And so what were the, yes, what were the issues? The issues were change. Ironically, when it was first announced that Kamala Harris was likely to be the Democratic nominee, she was seen as the agent of change. And we watched that those numbers shift over time through the summer, she had a better she had a better month in September after well, their convention. Well, I, and that um, just the Trump campaign defined her as part of the Biden Harris ticket. And so that and she never got out from that catch twenty two, I don't think. I think there are real reasons that have to do with very specific issues as to why people voted for President Trump and for Republicans down the line. I would say that Jay's point is well taken about the sitcom concept. And that is, you know, we have a country of reality TV that's fake that we think is real. And we have real news that's become the gamification, to use your words, Jay, of politics. 
So the, the fake is real and the real is not real. So it's gotten a little convoluted. As Jay said in the intro, we've moved on from Halloween. And yes, and I'm not going to have you do your turkey gobble imitation again, Jay. It was so Thank good. You. You, couldn't, you. you couldn't improve upon it. So we're just going to leave it alone. But the question that uh, Ipsos has provided in November of 05, uh, which we collected from the uh, Roper archives at Cornell, Ask the question of what part of the turkey is your favorite at Thanksgiving? And this is something that we all can weigh in on, I'm sure. But the turkey breast at 55, number one, the thigh at 20, number two, the leg at 13, number three, the wing at four, and in fourth place, and then the nun and the don't like turkey and whatever, single digits. But turkey breast way out in front. I'm a member of that society. I, I would be the leading cause of that. But I'll, were there some vegetarian? Cause of that? Were there any vegetarians? Yeah, leading, vote, uh, leading vote. I would leave the cause. You no, know, I know this was almost 20 years ago, but were there any non-turkey eaters in the numbers, Lee? Not, not, not uh, that were appreciable, but I do know people who don't do that. Don't do there turkey. were 3% who said they don't like turkey, but we can't assume they're vegans. Yes. No. <laughs> right. Anybody so else not... get a feeling that, that Lee was doing a family feud? A uh, segment yeah. as, he, <laughs> as he was announcing the results there. Yeah. <laughs> Barb, so, Barb, what's your what's your what's your well, favorite among well, them? Barb's you know, favorite uh, is reservations. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like I I actually like most parts of the turkey as long as it is uh, moist and flavorful. Although growing up, I think the wings were the part of of choice in the household, and I remember one Thanksgiving where. The turkey we got had, I think, six or eight wings. So I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I think it was, I think it was mom trying to make everybody happy. Now, I'm not an anatomist here, but I'm going to say I don't think turkeys have six to eight wings. <laughs> I'm trying so. to get into left wing and right wing there, but I can't. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, oh. God. Uh, well, we, we definitely had a parliament. How's that? We did not have a two wing Thanksgiving. Mary, what is what should we expect in your neighborhood? I am not. I am a none of the above because I like the turkey skin. It does not oh. matter as long as it's crisp. Mm. And well cooked, I that was that's my once a year sort of indulgence that when I was a kid, I would have to not really fight for, but they would save me the crisp turkey skin. I'll have a turkey dinner with you anytime. You can just have as much <laughs> as you want with that. That's worth fine. Jay, yeah, Jay agrees you... with me. Ma yeah, Mary and I can't have turkey dinner together because wow. we'd be fighting over the skin. That's the best part of the of the, the wing. When you mentioned the wing, Barb, that actually came out first. Like we got to eat that while the, the turkey rested. And that's why I love it. And it has the crisp uh, skin on it. But I'm a uh, dark meat, thighs, and, and all of that. I will tell you that this year I'm going to spatchcock the turkey, which is to cut out the backbone and flatten it like you do with chickens. And I'm going to do that because it'll cook in like an hour, even though it's a 20-pound turkey. And we'll see how that goes. If I poison all our guests, it's been nice knowing you. Um, well, hang on a second. Are you doing that yourself or are you having the butcher do that for you? Oh, really? No, no. I spatchcock chickens. It's, you just cut out the backbone. I have poultry shears and it's not. There's YouTube videos if you really, but okay. it's not. That's not I'm, hard. Now, I have. I do have a friend who's deboning their turkey. I am not deboning, including the wings. I'm like, you're yeah. crazy. No. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, wow. not doing that. But it cooks in like 45 minutes, apparently. That's turkey like, filet? So might as well yeah. just get still for dinner at that point, I guess. Student producers. What's going on in your households? I definitely like the skin too. I agree with that. And then that outside is... of that, the dark meat. I don't know, the breasts, too dry. Like no matter how much gravy you put on them, I feel like that, it's always, that, that's always a little dry. Me and Neil always seem to be on the opposite sides of these things because I am <laughs> gonna say breast, but I'm just saying that because I hate the bone. I hate having to like work with the bone. My dad loves it. My dad loves the taste of the bone and everything. I don't really understand that perspective. I think when we ask this question down the road, we are going to have to put in skin because we're running a plurality, if not a majority here. So well, maybe know. a vegetarian option too. I think Barb's yeah. point is well there's, taken. I think there's, there's a lot of people who don't have turkey for Thanksgiving anymore. Well, I also think that maybe the question is, what's your favorite part of Thanksgiving dinner and move away from the turkey? Ah, ah, there you my go. My guess is that's coming in a future fun fact, but I don't know that for sure. We'll see. Can't wait. Uh, so, Lee, can you gobble us out, please? <laughs> no, I will not. I refuse. Uh, 
to follow your lead on that, but we'll just wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. When we get there, we're not quite there yet. We'll have a program between now and then. That'll do it for Poll Hut this week. Poll Hub is produced by the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Mary Griffith is our executive producer. Casey Schaff is our production supervisor. The Poll Hub team includes Hunter Petro and Neil Viswanathan. If you enjoy Poll Hub, please consider leaving a review. Positive reviews help other listeners like you find us. If you'd like to learn more about polling and survey science, check out the Marist Poll Academy, our free online learning portal. If you have questions for us, tweet them at us at Maris Poll. Remember, you can always tell your smart speaker to play Poll Hub, and with any luck, it'll cooperate. Finally, wherever you listen to Poll Hub, there is a subscribe button. Click it, and the latest episode will be ready for you in your podcasting app as soon as it's released. We'll We'll see see you next time. time.